Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome again. Uh, I'm Wei Ping Wu, the director of the Master of Science in Urban Planning here at Columbia GSAP. Uh, good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, I hope um, you're doing well and uh, we appreciate that you're taking time to um, get to know our program a little bit. So um, we have an hour and a half. And um, so let me just outline a little bit how we're gonna go about in that time. And we are also recording the session. So I hope you are okay with that. And if you are not, you know, just turn off your video. So I have uh, my colleague, uh, Kian Goldman also on the line. She's the assistant director of the UP program. Good evening, everyone. And uh, we also have the uh, GSAP admissions also in the background in case you're having any trouble with Zoom and so on and so forth. So I'm going to spend about 25 minutes to 30 minutes or so uh, outlining the program, the curriculum. And then, you know, if you have any questions uh, while I'm talking, just jot down in the chat box. Uh, Kian can uh, answer or will answer a little bit later. And then around 7.40ish, we'll have a few of our current students joining me and I will have some questions for them, some very general questions often prospective students are interested in knowing. And then um, you can then ask them questions, ask me questions uh, until about 8.30. So I um, uh, hope this will be helpful for you. So as you can see from the image, this is the home of Jisa Avery Hall. And so I know you all have made the decision to study urban planning, so I don't have to convince you about that. Uh, but why New York City? Why Columbia? And why, right, um, GSA? And that's, I guess, we want to um, uh, outline a little more today uh, to help you to make that decision. As much as, um, you know, we would like to welcome all of you to be on campus uh, at GSA you know, when fall 2023 comes, really the most important, one of the most important uh, decisions for you is to see the match between your interests and what we have to offer, right? So, so let me outline what we have to offer. So New York City obviously is a great uh, context to study urban planning. And it's a global city. It's a city full of opportunities. It's a city still trying to come back during a uh, pandemic. And it's a city also full of inequality and full of urban challenges. What better location to study urban planning than New York City? So this uh, graph actually is uh, a GIS illustration of inequality in New York City. And it's, it illustrates the kind of critical analysis that planning students do in the program to try to understand where in the city uh, inequality is most concentrated, for instance, where in the city is vulnerability most acute, say to sea level rise or to other uh, disasters, natural or man-made. And so the planning program here is very much grounded in this kind of social, economic and political analysis of neighborhoods and cities and using New York as a major laboratory, but of course, uh, other cities and the global conditions the other cities are situated in as well. At the same time, this illustration is also very useful. It also illustrates the kind of technical skills and especially spatial analysis skills that you will gain in our program. Our program is very much known for its spatial analysis. And so GIS is a core required course and our students gain very critical kind of, not just skills, but understanding of how to use GIS in your process of understanding a city and analyzing the city. We are also very much using New York to understand climate change and the changes that will be brought to the cities. So this is one of um, our um, data analytics courses called the uh, environmental data analysis. So our students use actual data to analyze the scenarios in which sea level rise will affect different parts uh, of Manhattan. And so you can see, right, uh, when the sea level rise is at a certain level, 
how much of Lower Manhattan will be actually um, affected or flooded, right? Lower East Side, just East Side of Lower Manhattan. So to say New York is a laboratory is not overstatement, but also we are very much connected to the global context uh, in which uh, cities are situated. And so because of this kind of connection with practice and with what's going on out in the world, uh, our curriculum is constantly uh, changing and innovating. And uh, I just wanna give you some examples of the new courses we've created in the last three years, right? So we have, every semester we offer about 17 to 18 electives. So each year we have something like 35 or so different electives offered to students just in the planning program. Of course, you can take electives across GSA and across Columbia as well. But as you can see, we're constantly trying to make sure that our curriculum is up to date with what's going on out in the world and with what's going on out in the planning practice. And you can see some classes are more comparative in its approach. Other classes are directly address climate change and the uh, need to uh, plan for disasters, plan for um, sea level rise, and plan for the kind of mobility that we need in this age of climate change. So for instance, I'm gonna give you this uh, example of future mobility workshop is a terrific new course we're offering right now this semester. It really uses big data using cell phone related kind of data to understand mobility, but also to analyze what future mobility patterns could be for different cities. So it's a course about the built environment and how we move around in the built environment, but it's also a course using big data. So we have a number of courses that are kind of like that. So I'll illustrate a little more. And then we have co-curriculum or extracurriculum activities. And so the weekly lectures in planning series um, is a major uh, attraction to our students and alumni. And I hope some of you were able to dial in this earlier today for Michelle talk about the native or oh, indigenous populations, water relations in the context of Canadian cities. So this is something we do quite a bit. In fact, there's a lot going on at Columbia. And another example was last weekend, uh, our group of uh, Chinese students or Chinese American, Chinese Canadian students organized a urban China forum to look at how uh, in the you know, current um, environment and climate that sustainable urban development should take place in China and comparable places. And so it was incredible amount of interest that we had thousands of people dialing in in China through the WeChat platform. I'm pretty sure on this call right now, there will be students also dialing in from China. So again, you can see we really, even in this kind of challenging situation, trying to connect with what's going on on the grounds in China and to have scholars in China speak uh, to our students. So urban planning in China, so I just, uh, I'm sorry, at Columbia, I just kind of outlined some of these unique features. And let me then outline a little bit of our curriculum. And of course, we have a fairly storied history. Uh, it's been something like you know, 80 to uh, 90 years old a program. And along the way, social equity has always been at, at the core. And then a global outlook uh, joined in as a very key component of the program fairly early on. And then um, we also have a accompanying PhD program that a lot of interactions between doctoral students and master's students. So quite a bit cross fertilization. And we have a dedicated group of full-time faculty. You can essentially look up on the UP uh, main webpage and Keon just uh, put in the chat box, the, um, the URLs to go to our main page and you can see what faculty we have. And our faculty, the full-time faculty is very productive in a sense of producing you know, knowledge about American cities, European cities, Middle Eastern cities, Chinese cities, and uh, we are, um, constantly uh, on the look for new areas of research to inform our teaching. 
And so all of our full-time faculty teach required core courses. So you'll have an opportunity to interact and get to know them. We also have a terrific group of very seasoned professional um, practitioners who primarily work in New York City, but also beyond uh, as adjunct faculty teaching, you know, the elective courses and a couple of them teach also required courses. And they are not only seasoned practitioners, they're also committed educators in the sense they have been, many of them have been with us for a number of years and they have great uh, confidence and uh, attention in our students in a way that they've connected some of our students and alums to their own work for internships, for jobs, and for other kinds of connections. So it's really a win-win situation in a way that our students are readily connected already with practitioners while at school and with opportunities that these practitioners and others uh, can bring to students. So just give you, this is just an example, right? At any given time uh, in each semester, we have about um, uh, 15 to 20 or so uh, adjunct faculty with us. And then the next semester, following semester, another 15 to 20. So in, over an uh, academic year, we have anything between uh, 35 to 40 adjunct faculty, essentially you know, that uh, 40, 35 to 40 electives, right? And we have these activities that connect students with adjunct faculty, you know, to have coffee, to have other um, interactions. And so you get to know them. Of course, taking courses is the best way to getting to know them. So the program is uh, accredited and we just actually received the seven year maximum reaccreditation uh, last year uh, for the next seven years. Two year program full time uh, with 60 points required. Each point is somewhat similar to a credit. So just think of as that. 27 points are required that include courses and the studio uh, in the second semester of first year and then thesis a capstone in the second year. So then you have 33 credits for, or points as electives. And um, you can take it, 12 of them in a concentration, which I will outline in a minute, or you can take the rest, 21 points anywhere, GSAP, Columbia. So that's yet another unique feature of our program. That is, we are quite flexible. We also encourage students to explore other interests, related interests, um, and to really broaden your perspectives. So we have four concentrations and I will illustrate each of them in a little bit. As you can see, um, we don't cover every aspect of planning. We do in the core courses, in electives some do, but in depth coverage happens in these four concentrations. So, Given the moderate size of a full-time faculty, uh, we don't try to be very comprehensive. So let's say if you're looking at MIT's uh, planning program, they cover everything, right? Everything, everything, literally. Uh, maybe Berkeley and to some extent Rutgers or to some extent Penn, UPenn. So, you know, I know these programs pretty well because I'm very involved with the uh, profession of teaching planning. So uh, I've looked at uh, curriculum uh, of various different programs. So I think we are unique in the sense we have strong focused strength. We have a very strong um, anchor in the built environment since we are in the you know, architecture school. We also have a very strong commitment to social and racial equity. We have a very strong global outlook. And then we have a very robust urban analytics uh, concentration. We are one of the first planning programs in the country uh, to really embark on that um, direction. So we now, since last year, have had a, a part-time option, which means if you've had two-year full-time or four-year part-time uh, equivalent, right? Uh, prior to applications, so application deadline is January, middle of January. So by that point, if you had that much experience, and somewhat related to planning, uh, you can go for the part-time option. Part-time option is about half course load. And so we expect part-time students to finish 
in about four years instead of two years. Um, if you have any questions about part-time options, feel free to ask or uh, email us. Um, so this is the outline of the curriculum. As you can see, the first two semesters a little bit more required courses. So the courses I listed there are required. And then second year is full on exploration and you can you know, pursue one concentration or two. About 40% of our students actually choose two concentrations so they have more kind of coverage of different topics. I generally encourage students in the first year to really explore, to really see where your interests are already or maybe down the road. So some students do change their mind. So it's at the end of third semester that we inquire with students about their chosen concentration to make sure by the fourth semester, they would already have completed the 12 point requirement. So another thing that's very attractive about our program is this dual degree uh, option that we have with programs both within GSA and beyond GSA. So we have dual degree programs with everything I've listed, nine different programs. And some students apply at the same time to both programs. And then uh, you get in, you can start a UP first or the other program first. We really don't care. We'll help you either way. Or some students uh, come in to UP, really want to explore more, and then they apply at the um, uh, second semester of first year uh, to, uh, to the other program. So any questions, just feel free to let us know. So build environment is perhaps the uh, most uh, kind of uh, diverse concentration. In there, we cover some land use, we cover transportation, mobility, environment, because we really believe many of these are connected uh, and we need to look at them together so uh, you, you will see the largest number of electives in this concentration. It is also the most popular uh, concentration for students. Any courses marked with uh, asterisk uh, really uh, satisfy uh, two concentrations because we do believe there are lots of interconnections among different topics. And so we encourage this sort of cross learning. And you can see examples of students working um, in a studio uh, related to build environment. Last spring, we finally were able to have in-person contact with clients, with communities and stakeholders. And so when we choose studio topics, we really try to also make sure different interests of students are considered. So the studio topics often are of different um, nature. Community economic development is the concentration that really embeds our long held um, tradition and commitment to social and racial equity. So as you can see here, we have not only engagement kinds of courses, but also courses about housing, affordable housing, and about um, local government, neighborhood land use activism. So, and certainly during this time of climate change, about uh, low carbon and energy transition through community-based approaches. And that's why the second to last course on the list satisfies uh, two concentrations. And then in, this is just an example of student work uh, related to this concentration. So I also want to kind of share with you another way that we structure of, um, our electives. So I would, like to tell students that we have three types of electives. The first type is what we call uh, knowledge intensive. So for instance, um, to, uh, we have a course called climate adaptation in cities. So it's quite a bit about some summary, you know, science about climate change and how climate change affects cities and how cities have been um, addressing such issues. So very much quite a bit readings, a lot of uh, discussion seminar type classes. Then we have what we call skill intensive electives and those, you know, all the urban analytics courses, right? And um, uh, are like that. So you learn skills, sometimes data skills, sometimes technical skills like site planning. 
in the uh, environment, uh, built environment concentration. And then the third type is what we call quite innovatively for planning programs is curric uh, uh, practicum. So this course was a practicum in which they embarked on the project. It's not quite as large as a studio, but it's a real project in collaboration with the high school in Washington Heights in New York City to look at a street project right in front of the high school. So we are practicum in a way, it's a little bit like a mini studio, but we also have practicum courses that are more like case studies, right? We, you know, many of you probably know business school uses a case study approach to really understand how companies do work. And we understand, we're trying to understand how uh, cities and uh, communities, uh, you know, cope with uh, planning issues and challenges. And, and so in a way that also forms a practicum. So international planning and development is a very much a strength of the program. We don't try to cover all of the various different geographical regions of the world. What we really try to do instead is to help our students understand how you approach a sort of commonly seen planning issue in a different place by analyzing local conditions, by analyzing how practices in other places, say the United States, and then your destination for studio, for instance, might be in Hong Kong, and next year actually they're gonna go be going to the Netherlands and Canada. And so how do you really make sure what knowledge you've gained in school can help you work in the local conditions? So in these international planning courses, we not only try to understand how different cities tackle and understand, uh, you know, tackle and cope with planning challenges in different local conditions. We also try to help our students gain that critical framework to uh, do work uh, that is very much situated in the local conditions. So finally, we're able to travel again next spring. We'll have travel studios. And this was a travel studio to Chile, to Chile a few years ago. So we're very excited about next uh, spring. Urban analytics, as I said, is growing. It's the, earth, the newest concentration. So it perhaps has the shortest list of electives, but there are also other digital, what we call the um, um, visual studies courses uh, in GSAP that you can take. And, uh, we continue to grow this concentration. And uh, you can also see uh, not only data that's sort of purely big analytics kind of course, we also have courses that are combined with um, domain knowledge, like environmental uh, data analysis, and then using sensors, which is really quite uh, uh, new for planning programs. Last but not least, so we have some skills courses that don't count for any concentration, but very, very important for students, especially those who have never had any design background, really want to gain that knowledge. And we have some of these skilled skills courses. And then you can see the example of student work for big data and data analytics here. So I'm also very, very proud that our program has very much, uh, you know, attention paid to the, helping our students develop professionally. That means career development, but career services, but beyond that. We really try to help our students understand what they want to do in their career and how that uh, can connect with what they study during the two-year program. So in terms of advising, we have three different layers. First is Kian and myself, we can do, we do general advising to make sure you will satisfy all of the curriculum requirements and, you, and especially for dual degrees and can be kind of complex. And then this year we have a new position already at work, uh, associate director focused on career planning, offering a vast uh, category of um, opportunities of training in terms of workshops, one-on-one -on -one, uh, advising sessions, to help you uh, start thinking about uh, your career directions as soon as you get in. And then at different points of the two years, continue to help students uh, think about those 
And then through programs such as mentorship with alumni, uh, through networking with alumni, through career fairs, through visits to planning organizations and offices to really expose students to how the various different kinds of practices that are in planning. One of our goals is also to make sure that our students not only are prepared for jobs that are more traditionally for planners, right, in the public sector or in planning consulting firms, but also to broaden the perspective for our students to work in neighboring fields and or what we call adjacent fields. So you'll see in a little bit of where our graduates work and in many ways is how we have um, developed our curriculum to allow those possibilities. Last but not least, you will have a faculty advisor who will really help you more with the intellectual growth and also think about your professional interests and so on. And then certainly in your second year, you will have a thesis advisor who may or may not be your actually an academic faculty advisor. So you'll have quite a bit connection with um, um, you know, faculty through this sort of uh, advising. So our graduates, as you can see, so this information is based on a survey of our recent grads and, and the kind of careers they are in. So we kind of put together something like a dozen or so career pathways to help our students think about their own. So you can see the top few are what we call somewhat traditional rules for planners or planning students, right? And then we say, you know, the example organizations are exactly the places where we have alumni. And then, then what kind of coursework you should focus on. And then as you move down along the table, you will start seeing career pathways that are less traditional, right? So global NGOs and the next page, you will see um, uh, real estate firm, urban tech firm, design firm. These are all places uh, in which uh, our, our graduates uh, have had the opportunity to work in. You know, we, we actually even have students who have worked at Apple, have worked at Microsoft, Google, because, you know, many of these tech com companies also deal with the local governments, right? Deal with um, um, sort of bio environment issues. Every year we have some students going for doctoral studies. So we also are very much able to help those students pursue those interests as well. So just wanna show you some images of the kinds of activities we organize for career fairs. We are very excited next semester, we're gonna be able to have in-person career fair again um, since pandemic. And so this was just before. And this is the UP, our program lounge. And every year, we do, the school does a um, end of year show. This is the, this was the urban planning's end of year show uh, showcasing their work in building sensors, uh, doing uh, advanced spatial analysis. And we're also very excited next semester we'll be able to do in person again. And a couple, last couple of years we've been mostly only doing, you know, uh, virtual end of year shows. And this is the lounge where our students hang out a great deal. And so next to the lounge is a computer lab with 30 computers with um, all of the software required. And then uh, next to both rooms is a classroom where a lot of uh, UP classes are held. So the UP students essentially live here in a way. We don't want them to live too long, over 24 hours. We do want to encourage a good life and work balance, but this is a space that you will find all of the students most likely. So the students also have an urban magazine and in which they can exercise their talent, uh, identify issues that they want to address. So last but not least, let me talk a little bit about the application process and the admission reviews. So uh, we have seven full-time faculty. So every single application will be reviewed by three faculty and three different faculty members, and they will come together to um, uh, get a comprehensive score for each application, then we um, uh, go from there. So we do look at everything in your package. So this year, GRE is not required. As such, we encourage you 
to really identify and tell us a little more about your analytical experience and skills in your personal statement. Uh, we ask that you write uh, at least 800 words, I believe, but double check on the application admissions page. Uh, you know, your experience can be quantitative or qualitative or both, uh, but we really want to understand um, how much analytical experience you've had because planning in a way it's a combination of design and social sciences. Uh, uh, I will be lying if I say you don't deal with numbers. You definitely deal with numbers in this program. I will be lying if I say you don't deal with the maps. You definitely deal with maps and GIS and spatial analysis. You will definitely will be dealing with visualization. You know, how do you, um, tell people or present to people ideas you have both in narratives and in visual forms. So uh, we would like to encourage you to do that. So if I have to say that if one piece of your application is perhaps the most important, I would say the statement, the personal statement, right? That uh, why do you want to study planning? It's okay if you don't have any planning uh, experience before. Our students come from a variety of backgrounds. Architecture is the simple, the single largest uh, concentration of prior background, um, but it's less than half. And then we have people coming from geography, political science, sociology, urban studies, environmental studies, biology, math, philosophy, arts, media, communication, everything, literally everything. So if you've never had any urban or planning related experience, tell us why you want to study, right? Tell us what's attractive to you and even tell us a little bit, what do you want to do after you studied urban planning? So that statement, if anything, go for longer, not for shorter. The more we can know about you, the more we can gauge your interest in the field and your readiness to enter the field. So, not last but not least, we do offer scholarships and there are three types of financial aid or in terms of scholarship that I can outline to you quickly. Uh, you should really check out the um, uh, school website for financial aid and they also have done some sessions. They, will should, they should have some tapings that you can watch if you miss those sessions. So quickly, while you apply, if you're interested in scholarship, you should indicate that interest. You should also, if you are American student, uh, fill out the federal you know, uh, FAFSA you know, form uh, so that we have some uh, understanding of your need. But the scholarship that comes at admission is merit-based. So generally goes to applicants who have the highest you know, scores after uh, the collective uh, comprehensive review by faculty. So that's one type of uh, financial aid. The second type is um, TAs and RAs. Uh, those are usually open more to second year students, but if you have decided to enroll, you will actually have the opportunity to apply. And we have 18 positions every year. Uh, for TAs and RAs, each position is one semester, and then um, uh, occasionally first-year students will uh, get that. It really depends on the match between the student's interests and preparation and the faculty and program needs. The third type of scholarship is what we call need-based, and that is only open to uh, enroll the students once you come to uh, Columbia TSAP. There is a need-based scholarship. It's $5,000 per person. I believe you can apply not every semester, but um, again, you should check out the GSAP website. Okay, so that's really quite a bit, and I went a little bit over time, but uh, still, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask now or in the chat box or send us an email or come visit if you can. 